Let us pray together. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, and open our eyes so that we may see. Open our ears so that we may hear. Open our minds so that we may understand. And open our hearts so that we may receive whatever it is that you have for us today. For we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Is your church a safe place for me? This is the question that he had been building up to for the last 15 or 20 minutes as we chatted over coffee. I first met Michael after one of our Christmas Eve services a few years ago. That evening after the service, he told me he hadn't been to church in a while, but was so glad that he came and how much he enjoyed the service, especially singing Silent Night in the candlelight. Would it be possible for us to get together and talk after New Year's? I I got some questions. I told him I'd love to visit with him and gave him one of my cards and told him to, to call or text whenever he was ready to talk. He reached out in early January, and a few days later we were sipping hot coffee on a cold winter day in a local coffee shop. After some initial chit-chat about what we did on Christmas and, and New Year, he said, you know, I really enjoyed the Christmas Eve service. I hadn't been to church in a few years, not since some stuff happened at home in the church I grew up in. What had happened was after he had shared with his family his truth, that he was transgender. Both his family and his church let him know that he was no longer welcome. And then he said, it took me a long time to finally be able to accept myself. And that's what I need to know. That's why I need to know, is your church a safe place for me? Michael moved away a few years ago, and I hadn't thought about him in a while, but until, not until I began sitting with the portion of 1 Corinthians we are looking at today. Now, just to remind you, 1 Corinthians is one of two letters from the Apostle Paul to the Christian community in Corinth. Corinth was a large, prosperous, urban city that served as the capital of the Roman province of Achaia. Paul had come to Corinth in and around AD 50 or 51, and with the help of others started a church there. In the New Testament, the word church never refers to a specially dedicated building with a steeple and organ and stained glass and pews. The New Testament word for church is ecclesia. It means called out ones. The church in Corinth wasn't a building. The church in Corinth was a little community of people inspired and shaped by the life, teaching, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Now, I don't know if you know this, but let me let you in on something. If you ever have people, you have problems because people are a mess. People are a mess because there's often a gap between what we say are our ideals and our values and, and how we actually live. Every subject matter that Paul addresses in 1 Corinthians deals with a gap between the aspirational values and the practice values of the church in Corinth. Aspirational values are how we want to live. Practice values are the way we actually live. One writer defined them this way, aspirational values express who you hope to be. Practice values are the sum total of the habits and actions you actually practice. For Paul and for the church, the paramount aspirational value is love or agape in the Greek language. Agape love is it a warm, fuzzy feeling that we get in our tummy when we, when we look at someone we like. Agape love isn't something that you fall into or out of. Agape love, the love that we see in Jesus' life, especially on the cross, has nothing to do with emotions or feelings. Agape love is the willful choice to put the, another's interest above one's own. Agape love it's unselfish giving, even to the point of sacrifice. It's unconditional love that always seeks what is best for others. 
It's the love of God that meets us where we are and loves us into fully becoming the person God created us to be. Like in chapters 8, 9, 8, 9 and 10, which we looked at last week, dealing with the consumption of meat sacrificed to idols, in chapters 11 through 14, Paul is using the logic of the cross, the logic of God's love revealed in Jesus to help the Corinthians more fully practice the aspirational value of agape love. Now, in these chapters, there are three presenting issues. In chapter 11, verses 1 through 17, uh, it deals with hats or no hats in church. It focuses on whether women and men should cover their heads when they are prophesying in church. In uh, chapter 11, 17 through 34, it's all about when the church gathers to share a meal and remember Jesus, how should everyone behave? And then chapters 12 through 14, are all about spiritual gifts. And since God is the source of every spiritual gift, there's no hierarchy of value. No one gift and no one person is more important than any other. Now, we're going to focus on those chapters next week, but I wanted to include it and just to mention it here this, today. In these chapters, Paul is uh, addressing problems he's heard about that are besetting the community. And he begins the section by exhorting them with these words, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. In everything that follows, Paul helps the Corinthians puzzle through the problems they are facing by helping them apply the logic of the cross to the various situations. The first passage deals with a cultural issue. How should people dress when they come to church? Specifically, it deals with whether women or men should wear anything on their head when they are pro prophesying. Now, time doesn't permit us to dig deep into the passage and teasing out all of the relevant information needed to fully understand all the culturally based gender issues at play in this passage. If you want to dig a little deeper in the passage, you can join me on Tuesday night at 6.30 for our online Bible study. You can simply email Christy Rangel and she will send you a Zoom link for the study. There are, however, two important things that I want to lift up for us today. The issue isn't whether women should lead or prophesy in church or not. Now, this is still a point of controversy in some churches. I remember several years ago, I went to a Dillard's in Shreveport to acquire a new white dress shirt. Being a pastor, you never know how people are going to respond when they find out what you do. Most of the time it'll either shut the conversation down or they'll take it as an opportunity to bombard you with all of the questions they've been having. When the sales associate asked what I did for a living, I, I was tempted to say something like, well, you know, I run a nonprofit that helps people in our community flourish, which technically is not a lie. But I, I didn't do that. I told him I'm a, I'm a pastor and when I did, I saw his eyes light up and he said, you are? Awesome. Look, I've got a question. Do you believe in women preachers? Now, remember, I had just gone into the store to get a new white shirt. I didn't come for some big theological discussion. In, in my experience, the role of women in church leadership can be one of those issues that goes sideways pretty quickly. Quite often, it's because the passion and people's confidence in their position often far outstrips their knowledge of what the Bible actually says. Anyway, I was in a, in a little bit of a puckish mood, and so in response to his question, do you believe in women preachers? I replied, believe in them? Hell, I've seen them. For Paul, the issue isn't whether or not it's proper for women to prophesy in church. He has seen women prophesy, and throughout his letters, he repeatedly lifts up and celebrates the ministry of the women who are the leaders in the various churches that he is connected with. The real issue here is helping people learn to distinguish between what's truly essential and what is not. Hairstyles, which was the focus of their controversy, is never unessential. Hairstyle and head coverings are always a secondary matter. In the specific cultural, culture of ancient Corinth, the context called for women to cover their heads and men to wear their hair short. 
But just because this was right for them back then doesn't mean that it's right for us today. It's a non-essential issue. What is truly essential always and everywhere for Christian communities is love. And the lack of love on display when the church gathers to celebrate the Lord's Supper is the focus of Paul's uh, writing in chapter 11, verses 17 through 34, where Paul starts the section with these words. Now, in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. Paul says it's so bad when y'all get together, it's actually better if you never got together at all. The issue at hand is how when they come together to celebrate the Lord's Supper, some are eating all the food and getting drunk, while others are going hungry. Once again, the church is divided, this time between the rich and the poor. The hierarchies and divisions are, are so bad in Corinth that Paul says, when you come together, it's not really to eat the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is supposed to be a place where the rich and the poor, slave and free, no matter what gender you may be, are treated with absolute equality. Every person is a person for whom Christ gave his life. Therefore, everyone matters and everyone's dignity must be guarded. The culture of ancient Corinth, in fact, the entire Roman world, was one in which very few people at the top of society lived in absolute unbelievable luxury and the vast majority lived in grinding poverty but that's not how it's supposed to be in the kingdom of God in the kingdom one's value and importance doesn't come from how much wealth you have in the kingdom of God your value comes from this fact you are made in the image and likeness of God you are a unique one-of-a-kind human being and you are of inestimable worth you're one for whom Christ died. As the church, we're called to model a different way of life for the world. In the ancient world and in our world today, there were people who were considered disposable, people who in the eyes of the world did not matter. The church is called to model for the world a different way. The church, grounded in the logic of the cross, the logic of, of self-giving love of Jesus considered no one disposable because everyone is equally valuable. In another one of his letters in Galatians chapter 3, Paul puts it this way, As many of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Now, I've shared with you before that I think Revelation 7, 9 is one of the most beautiful and inspiring verses in, in all of the Bible. It says, I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands, they cried out in a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. Every week when we gather, we pray the, the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. As the church, the people of God called to live and model a different way of life for the world, our calling as the church is to show the world what the life of heaven is like here and now. What I see in that picture of Revelation 7-9 is that heaven is the place where all the glorious diversity of humanity, every race and language and culture and tribe and every way human beings understand and express themselves, find their unity around the Lamb of God. Not too long ago, I heard Michael Curry, uh, presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, tell a story about his parents. He said uh, his mother was Episcopalian, and at the time, 
was dating a, a young man who was licensed to preach in the Baptist tradition. One Sunday, she took him to church with her. Bishop Curry and his parents are African American. The church his parents went to that morning was all right, white. It was in the 1940s in the segregated heart of America. When his mother went to take communion, his father sat in the pew because in those days, if you were a Baptist, you didn't take communion in an Episcopal church and vice versa. So he sat in the pew and she went up to communion as the only black person in the congregation. And he waited to see what would happen. Because not only were they taking the bread, they were also drinking from the same cup. And his father, his father had never seen black folk and white folk drink out of the same cup or from the same water fountain. As his mother knelt at the altar rail, one of the priests came by and gave her the bread, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. A few moments later, another priest came by with the chalice. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ given for thee, preserve thy body and soul into everlasting life. And he gave her the cup. Bishop Curry says that his father let him told him that he became an Episcopalian that day. Because any church where black and white drink from the same cup has discovered something that I want to be a part of and that the world needs to learn about. The Lord's Supper in, in Corinth had devolved into being just one more place where the tired old hierarchies and divisions of the world were on display. And Paul says that's not how it's supposed to be. At the table of the Lord, everyone is welcome because at the table of the Lord, we can experience a unity that overcomes even the deepest estrangements between human beings. I, I love this quote from Dr. Clark Soule's book. She writes, signing on with Jesus means committing to a community of people that includes folk you might not otherwise come across in your daily life or might not consider equal to you and probably never felt responsibility for before. When we say yes to Jesus, we're saying yes to everyone that Jesus said yes to. And Jesus said yes to everyone. When Michael asked me if our church was a safe place for him, he was asking if Broadmoor would say yes to him just as he was. What I told him that day was this. I said, Michael, I genuinely think it is. But know this. If ever anything happens, anything that makes you feel unsafe, please let me know and I'll be the first person standing beside you. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. When I think about the logic of the cross that Paul lifts up time and again in this letter, what it shows to me is that what we are called to do is to model for the world the unconditional, unreserved, sacrificial love of Jesus Christ that accepts and embraces all people just as they are. So I wonder what might happen. I wonder what might happen if you ask the Spirit today to help you find just one small part of your life where agape love is more of an aspirational value as opposed to a practice value. Some small place where there's a gap between what you say is most important, following Jesus, and how you're actually living your life day in and day out. Identify that place and ask the Spirit to help you to take one more step into becoming a person whose life and whose witness models the agape love that we see in Jesus, a person whose life models the logic of the cross, a person whose life bears witness to the unity that we all have in Christ.